it was Wright who was one of the people who who made me conscious of the need to struggle. You, you understand what I mean? Even though later I come up and say, well, man, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Still, in the sense of him describing and analyzing the whole existence of black people as an oppressed nation, uh, that's priceless. I was scared. Scared. All my life I heard of black men being killed because of white girls. And there I was. Richard Wright proved that a, a black writer could write considerably better than most of the white writers of his day. And after Native Son, the, the condescending attitude toward black writers was over. He said, nothing comes before my art. The, for him, his art was sacred. He didn't care about anything else but that. What he had to do was the most important thing. imagine what it had to be like to live under conditions of not only repression, tremendous uh, racist uh, discrimination, but no outlet for talking about it, for seeing a way of changing. In the early 1940s, I would say that most white Americans never thought about blacks. They never thought about blacks except maybe as maids and quarters. And there was no consciousness of all of what was going on in the country. They had been objects, they had been photographs, they had been images, they had been uh, silly, simply voiceless. White people only knew black people. Um, in certain kinds of movies and films. It was black musicals, it was Shuffle Along, the comic routines, it was the wonderful jazz music, of course. I mean, what people talk about in terms of the Harlem Renaissance, the jazz age. All of that was part of the, uh, or created an imagery of black people that Wright had to transform. The problem that, that Wright understood is that black men have to deal with tremendous problems every day of their lives and yet nobody understands that. And if you don't understand those problems, you can't have any sympathy. So what he wants us to do is to shock us into recognition. Bigger gets a job driving for the Daltons, a wealthy white family. That night, he drives their daughter, Mary, to a rendezvous with her communist boyfriend, Jan. Jan and Mary drink all evening. Later, Bigger has to carry Mary, thoroughly drunk, to her bedroom when her blind mother interrupts, Bigger tries to quiet Mary. Mary, honey. Mary. Are you all right? Mary, dear. You aren't asleep, are you? I hear you moving about. Everything smells of alcohol. Mary, been drinking again. <laughs> Here is a young man who, intimidated by the voice of a white woman, representing the power of white lives, a blind woman, he's afraid that this woman will discover him in the room. And he is so terribly afraid of this white woman and what she represents. He puts that pillow on Mary's head so she can't make a sound. So that murder is very much accidental. And it's important in the reading and in the interpretation of the novel for us to understand that it's accidental in order for us to then understand the depth of that fear. Wright made Bigger's fear the driving force throughout the remainder of Native Son. A fear that caused Bigger to do terrible things. It was this emotion Wright felt that corrupted race relations in America. It was a, a terror of what might happen if you stepped out of line. 
Remember, he was a product of the South. Even in its transformed state in Chicago, it was still the South. So you were always having to be on your toes about what you did. Because the least little thing you did might cost you your life. Right, fear was central to his thinking and living in the South. It was built into him from the very beginning. Families teach children fear because they want them to survive. For black families in Mississippi, especially sharecropping families, fear was the main response to a code of behavior whites imposed called Jim Crow. It's very important to understand what Jim Crow meant to a child, to a Richard Wright in the early part of this century. He describes part of it to us and for us. That is, when whites, because they're white, have total power over your life and over your death as well, that neither means much to them. Nathaniel and Ella Wright, Richard's parents, spent their lives under Jim Crow. His father was an illiterate sharecropper. Nathaniel met Ella at a country social in this one-room church and school near Natchez, Mississippi, where she taught part-time. The children of rural black families attended school only from November through February, so in March, cotton could be replanted. Ella and Nathaniel lived in a cabin near the Mississippi River. He inherited his sensitivity and sensibility from his mother, not from his father. He looked like his father. He probably sounded like him, but he was his mother's child. Richard, the first of two sons, was born on a plantation in 1908. And those plantations were all over Mississippi. This particular plantation was 25 miles north of Natchez. And I think it was Rutgers. But the three plantations there together were the earliest uh, habitation for all of his family, his father's people. Traveler's Rest, the Huggets, and Ruckers. The land on Traveler's Rest was where his father and his grandfather farmed as slaves. Then, in 1914, when Richard was six, an event a world away forced many sharecroppers across the South off the plantations. With the start of World War I, the European market for American cotton collapsed, triggering a great migration of rural blacks to large cities. 